Coming up next on Arizona Horizons, Journalists Roundtable. Maricopa County Attorney Bill Montgomery calls on Attorney General Tom Horn to resign. This as Montgomery faces criticism for advising a gubernatorial candidate and for not filing criminal charges against a former state senator's son. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Hank Stevenson, also from the Arizona Capital Times. Maricopa County Attorney Bill Montgomery thinks Attorney General Tom Horn should resign, so I'm guessing uh, Attorney General Horn just handed in his papers right then and there, right? Yes, of course. He said, Your Highness, I shall follow <laughs> thine words. Of course not. Um, what started as a Twitter uh, war uh, between a, an aged staffer and the county attorney and now it has now escalated into the uh, county attorney saying, Tom Horn should resign because of the totality of his actions, of all the things that he's done, of all the controversies that he, you know, has faced, been accused of. And of course, Tom Horn said, well, maybe it's you, it's you who should resign. Yeah, basically Horn said, yeah, you're the one abusing your office. Why don't you uh, resign? Well, he also said, you know, this started as, as Luigi said, you know, S Stephanie Grisham, who's Horn's press aide, mentioned something about Montgomery and whose advice he's offering. And Montgomery says, well, you know, uh, you know, I'm doing the good of the state, and you know, Stephanie says, well, what do you mean? And he says, and so Montgomery responds essentially, well, if Tom was interested in the good of the state, he'd resign. And of course, Horn responds now in, in, you know, in, in a statement saying, well, you know, he's the one engaged in silly activities. Look, there's plenty of blame to throw around on this thing. You know, you've got politicians. Each of them has an ego the size of Duluth. Uh, they're just each convinced of his or his own ways being correct. And so, uh, you know, the voters will get a chance in November. They'll decide actually in August whether Tom Horn should be nominated or Mark Brnovich, who is being backed obviously by Mr. Montgomery, and they'll decide in two years whether Bill Montgomery should stay. Yeah, that, that fact that uh, backed by Mr. Montgomery, uh, Brnovich, that's a major factor here, is it not? Yeah, I think that's the main factor here. Uh, you've got political opponents calling on each other to resign. Um, obviously, neither, neither of them has stepped down yet. I don't think this tactic has ever worked anywhere, calling on your opponents opponents or your, you know, uh, people who you're aligned with, uh, their opponents to resign. It just, it doesn't happen. But it's it, what it does, move. it keeps the drumbeat. Yeah. The drumbeat about Montgomery saying he is the only elected state official, attorney general convicted of a crime while in office. Now this was a, a essentially a bump and run, pleaded no contest, uh, but it keeps that message going. And it, particularly with Brnovich who has no money, this becomes a way to get earned media on it. How he's right. It adds to this narrative that even members of Tom Horn's own party are now saying, you know, this guy should not just not run for office, but he should step down as uh, attorney general. And of course, you know, as, as has been pointed out, Montgomery is, of course, supporting uh, Tom Horn's opponent, Sir Mark Brnovich. And right now he, it, it doesn't show that he has the money uh, to truly be competitive in this area. Well, we have yet to see if he does. Well, he and the fact is, look, even Montgomery admitted he's not expecting Horn to step down. Although, you know, if you want to get into conspiracy theories here, if Horn were to step down, it's Janet, the, uh, Jan Brewer who gets to name the replacement, who could name Brnovich right. as, as the heir apparent, of course, given the two-term limit that would cut Brnovich short four years from now. And we mentioned Brnovich is, uh, has Montgomery as a political ally. He also apparently has the county attorney as a legal advisor. What's that all about? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting one. Yeah, it, the county attorney has uh, come under some criticism for actually providing some sort of legal advice on this issue of uh, immigrants being shipped to Arizona. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of interesting to have him in this dual role of supporter of Ducey and also county attorney where he's supposed to give legal opinions but probably not to candidates and probably not on this kind of an issue. And, and this gets tricky because look, I called Bill Montgomery today for an opinion on something that Kelly Ward wants to do, which we'll talk about later. Is that outside of his scope? I mean, I'm not running for anything, but here's what it really comes down to. Bill Montgomery is criticizing Tom Horn for allegedly using his office for political purposes. 
If you're going to be out there throwing stones, you ought to be, you know, purer than Caesar's wife in terms of anything your office is doing that could be taken as political. There are some, though, saying this even violates state statutes for sitting county attorneys. Well, here's the problem. Uh, if he's using resources, in other words, if he's taking a request from Doug Ducey, farming it out to his staff, maybe. Now, if it's Bill Montgomery saying, oh, I can answer that question, uh, we get into the same problem to a certain extent that uh, even Tom Horn has. You know, when mm -hmm. is he doing stuff on the clock, off the clock? He's a salaried person. I think, you know, look, you'll get three attorneys, you'll get six opinions as to whether he's violating the law. I think that it's certainly on the edge. But from an appearance perspective, it's bad. There are certain things, if you're going to be out there criticizing somebody else for political use of your office, then you better damn well stay away from that. Does this impact Ducey's campaign? I don't think so. I mean, these are the kinds of things that we see all the time. I mean, it's ripe for all sorts of claims, all sorts of insinuations to be raised at this point during the primary. I think ultimately what impacts the campaign is the candidate himself, his actions, how much money he has, and really how good his opponents are. And right now we have a very competitive primary. And I think, you know, whatever the actions of his sur surrogates are at this point, I, w I don't think they would really matter. Like I said, what would matter is what Ducey does and how much money he has. and you know, how competitive his opponents can be. And the other half of it is, if you don't like Bill Montgomery, you won't like Doug Ducey. And so that's the way it, it tends mm -hmm. to affect it. Now, if you happen to like Bill Montgomery, the fact that he's working with Ducey might, might tend to move some votes. Uh, speaking of Montgomery, there was also a fatal accident involving a Maricopa County uh, Sheriff's deputy. Uh, that deputy, the son of Russell Pierce. Mm -hmm. Russell Pierce, a supporter of Bill Montgomery. Um, and of course, Maricopa County Sheriff's Department run by Joe Arpaio, a supporter of Bill Montgomery. And uh, this particular deputy, not criminally charged in a, in a nasty, fatal accident, which again, raises some questions here, does it not? Well, it does raise some questions, uh, but like I said, I mean, th it, this is a legal matter. Uh, there is an insinuation by the family of the, of the victim that maybe this is being done because, you know, Bill Montgomery has political ties with uh, Sheriff Joe. Uh, Sheriff Joe, of course, is a, is a political ally of Russell Pierce, and Russell Pierce is a former state senator. I mean, these are all sorts of insinuations allegations that are being raised at this point. So yeah, there's that narrative. At the end of the day, you know, this is something that a county attorney has to, um, to consider. The facts are that we have a deputy. He was on the job. Uh, of course, he was running way, way beyond the, the speed limit and he killed somebody. And, and not, not beyond the speed limit, he was in an unmarked car with no lights and no siren. You know, I might, probably would have made a different decision based on that. If you've got no lights and no siren, you get on the radio and you say, excuse me, you know, can you find somebody for me? The other piece of it, and this comes down to appearances. If you've got those political ties, is there any reason you, you can't find another county attorney, another prosecutor to handle this, another way to separate it out from your office? And that, again, comes down to what you should be looking at in terms of what does it look like? And that, according to the county attorney, is a prime example of amateur analysis. Well, and I have been guilty of amateur analysis of, on this show since 1982. Well, but the point is Montgomery has responded to those suggesting there might be some influence, and he calls that amateurism, and he says that there, there's enough of a question here, and he thinks this, if it gets settled, civil courts are where this should be handled. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that you look at the facts of the case, speeding uh, way beyond, I think it was 80 and a 45, no lights, no sirens, and still they're saying that, you know, th that those aren't the only factors you look at. He was uh, on the job going to check out a homicide suspect, mm -hmm. and, and frankly, he had the authority to be going that fast. And there might have been some obstructed vision there that he've mentioned. But again, why not farm it out? Why exactly. leave that cloud? You're right. This is going to be settled in civil court. The family will sue the county. The family will, will, will sue. The, the deputy involved, the investigator involved. But the fact is that you, there are certain things you should farm out. There are certain things that you, you declare a conflict, you declare a potential conflict, right. and say, why am I asking for trouble? Yes, and so, as I asked regarding the impact on the Ducey, does this hurt Montgomery politically at all? Uh, <laughs> you know, it, that's tough to say at this point. I don't think it does. Mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is that 
Uh, you know, he is the, the incumbent. If he seeks re-election, he probably will win. Um, this is the county. Uh, Maricopa County is still a very Republican district. I mean, you know, all, all these questions that are being raised at this point, um, some of them will probably play out during the election, during his election, if he does seek for re-election. But, you know, at the end of the day, the fact is that we do have more Republicans in this county. I think he still wins his race. And he still wins his county attorney race, but you've got to wonder about future ambitions as well. Well, what's really tricky, though, is it's real hard for county attorneys to run for attorney general for a simple reason. County attorneys are elected on a different cycle. Yep. So if somebody wants to run from county attorney for AG, they have to resign to run. And that's why we haven't had a lot of them coming that way. We mentioned the shipment of uh, illegal folks, undocumented folks. Describe them as you will from Texas to Arizona. Now Attorney General Tom Horn is threatening to go ahead and sue the Department of Homeland Security, Howie, to sue the oh. feds over all this. Uh, a couple of problems. I read the letter. I went and looked at the federal laws he cited. Number one, there's a law that makes it a crime to transport people who are in this country illegally. It's knowingly transport doesn't apply to the federal government. Number two, the question of the duty of, the, of Homeland Security and Customs and Border Protection to secure the border. We've been down this path. Right. Tom Horn filed suit in 2011, went to a federal court, and federal court said, you cannot mandate the federal government to, do, to tell them how to do their job. Horn says, well, this is different. That was an act of omission. This is an act of commission by transporting people here. You're doing the job, as he said, of coyotes, of, of bringing them into the interior of the country. Howie raises an, an interesting point. Uh, the way I understand this one, I could be wrong, is that when they come here, they're actually not bust here. They come here via plane. Um, then they go to the Tucson facility where they're processed. After they are processed, then they're dropped off at the Greyhound bus stations. All this time, they are under the custody of, the, of federal agents. And as Howie pointed out, you know, the law that says illegal transporting does not apply to federal mm -hmm. agents. And, and he, indeed, and, and through all this, uh, the Attorney General, Tom Horn, is saying he's going to give the feds a reasonable amount of time now to fix this before he takes action. Without ever defining what reasonable um, amount well, of time is. And here's where it gets interesting. I was talking to somebody from ICE this afternoon who said, we, we aren't doing any more of these family busings. Mm -hmm. The busings that are taking place are of children. And that clearly doesn't apply here because these kids are remaining in the custody of Customs and Border Protection from Texas, flown into Arizona, taken by bus to Nogales, then, then transported from there to a, to, a, to a Health and Human Services facility. And what, what, why is this? What, what's going on here? What, what is all this? Politics? Is it, is, are, are you suggesting well, politics? No, I'm not this? talking about Horn. I'm, I'm moving past Horn to the actual practice of shipping these folks. Whose idea was this? You know what? That's a very good, good question. It's not really very clear how this policy came about. What we don't know, what we don't know is that there's a crisis at the border. There are hundreds, I'm sorry, scores of thousands of kids that are crossing the Rio Grande and are surrender, surrendering themselves to uh, Border Patrol agents instead of fleeing from them. The border, border Patrol stations in Texas are overwhelmed. They cannot accommodate this many people. Of course, there's one side of it because the legal process of processing, of getting them through the system. Mm -hmm. But there's also the humanitarian side of it. I mean, these kids have been through a lot. They, you know, some of them have not had um, a, a bath or uh, some of them are, have not had food. Um, and so you have to take care of them. And, and yeah, our system is but, being overwhelmed. That's, but, the, but that's take, the problem. You take care of them, but do you fly them all the way to Phoenix? Well, but the, the yeah. problem becomes there, and you know, Hank knows some of this too, is that the argument is we can only process so many people right. in San Antonio and the Rio Grande Valley. So you've got two choices. Either you fly some CBP people there, assuming you even have the space to do it, or you fly the migrants here to process them here. And that's the, the course that they took. Look, there are 47,000 unaccompanied children yes. in the first nine months of the year who have crossed over, and 33,000 of them are through the Rio Grande Valley. You can only process so many folks. So the idea is you move them here. I, I guess the question though is, here, okay, but elsewhere too, or no? Well, they've got to kind of spread it out, and then they've got to have facilities to house these people. A yes. lot of them don't have anywhere to go. You see down in Nogales, they're housing about a thousand, a little bit more than that right now, and nobody's really entered the places, seen the conditions as far as outside observers. Um, 
So there, there are a lot of questions about this program, and I think it's going to stick around for a long time. But some of the most fundamental questions about this haven't been answered. Uh, you know, why are we seeing this huge influx of uh, young, unaccompanied immigrants coming to the well, states? Well, and that, that, gets it, that gets into sort of macro geopolitical stuff. You've got, on one hand, the question of Honduras is the murder capital of the world on a per capita basis. So you have a lot of people who are fleeing. I mean, they are refugees. Do they fit the legal definition? I don't know. The fact that they're willing to come up through Mexico and deal with you know, the Mexican authorities and the bribes and, and, mm -hmm. and the shootings there to come here for a better life, that suggests something. And the fact is that what we know is that we're not getting the kids from Costa Rica. We're not getting kids from Mexico. We're getting from, from El Salvador and Guatemala right. and Honduras, which suggests it is a specific problem there. Well, what's really interesting to watch is how the states are reacting. The states are getting these migrants are reacting. Of course, what we see in Arizona is a two-pronged, it's not a two-pronged approach, but two responses, two reactions to it. On the one hand, we have the nonprofits, the churches, the, uh, the groups that are out there and said, this is a humanitarian crisis that we have to deal with. And so they're out there, they're trying to help. Um, on the one hand, we have the politicians who are saying, well, it's also a humanitarian crisis, but we're also blaming the feds. And, you know, this is what you should not be doing. And we have politicians, including in this state, who are fundraising off of this particular... I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Well, obviously, you know, we've talked about the fact that the governor has something called JANPAC. It's a federal political action committee so she can affect congressional races. Well, sure enough, yesterday, even as Jay Johnson, head of Homeland Security, was holding a press conference, even as folks were looking for alternative ideas, little note goes out from JANPAC. Send a, send a petition to the president telling him to, to stop this outrageous activity. And by the way, wouldn't hurt if you gave me a little bit of money. Only takes two minutes to make a donation. Honey. Only takes two minutes. And critics of that move are basically saying, instead of that approach, why not say, hey, what can we do here in Arizona to help? Exactly. It, it looks bad. I mean, it looks like you're trying to fundraise off of a, a, a lot of kids who are going through a very hard time. Uh, it, it, if nothing else, it, it's just bad PR. But you've, you've got another factor with, with, to, to look at the other side. The message has gotten to the Central American countries. If you can get here, That's indeed. you will be reunited with your family members here. Now, Jay Johnson in his press conference said, yes, they said, look, that's what our law requires, particularly for children. That's what humanity requires. I mean, what are we going to do? It's not, you cannot send them unaccompanied children back to Honduras. It's not even you can put them back across the border here. And apparently, we talked about political uh, ramifications of all this. We have a state lawmaker, uh, this, this mm -hmm. time from the legislature, from the Senate, who thinks that we should put National Guard troops <laughs> on the borders. Uh, yeah. Not the border, the but borders. the borders. The well, other we, Mexico. The, the, uh, the, uh, New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, California. What's this all about? Uh, a giant box around the state of Arizona where federal authorities can't come in. So, yeah, we have, we have a state senator, uh, Kelly Ward, uh, from Lake Havasu City, suggested to Governor John Brewer what our responses should be. He's saying, you know, the, obviously this is a problem the feds have to solve. In the meantime, what, what can we do? So she's proposing that the National Guard be activated to secure our borders with our surrounding states, that the constitutional sheriffs could band together and prevent busloads full of illegal aliens from entering the state. And then, of course, the Attorney General, she is saying, could also, you know, find other remedies. Uh, all, of course, are problematic on, on a so, variety of variety I'm, yeah, I'm saying the, the, legally, I mean, how do you determine, I mean, leaving aside the fact that Kelly wants the National Guard over there on I-10 next to New Mexico, and the fact is they're flying over, but leaving that, that particular problem aside. She also aside, wants them in airports. And she wants them in airports, but in fact, when they're getting off the planes, they're being put on buses run by the federal government, and I'm sure that the federal officials are going to stop for the Pima County Sheriff's deputies. If, if, if this 10th Amendment, Howie, these sheriffs are the constitutional legal hierarchy of the land. Yes, they so, are, and I, and I salute every time I, I well, see sheriffs. Well, so, but, the, but the problem becomes that, look, I talked to Bill Montgomery, I talked to Paul Babieu, who these people who are not shy about dealing with immigration. There is no authority. U.S. Supreme Court in 2012 struck down most of 1070 that said you can make state crimes. So you've got a problem. What do you stop them on? What is your probable cause for stopping the bus? What do you hold them on? There is no authority there. The one question that I really had in mind when I read her letter to the governor is that, okay, assuming we go beyond all these, uh, the legal problems that you know, our uh, proposal will face, 
uh, assuming that they're being bussed, not you know, be, uh, being, uh, uh, via plane, how do you know which Greyhound buses are uh, uh, carrying uh, illegal aliens? The ones with the brown people. You're not how paying you, attention. How, how do you, you see? Look, you look, I'm telling you. No, that's the problem. But that's part of the issue is there's no probable cause. You would, you would have to have somebody, assuming they were being bussed in service, somebody in, let's say, New Mexico, calling up the sheriff and saying, I see people getting on a bus here in Lordsburg yeah. who I believe are illegal to stop the bus. There's no precedent. There's no probable cause. Okay, and there's no chance that this thing is going to go anywhere. Oh, heck no. Even the governor's office, which is happy yes. to, to, to do anything they can, Andrew Wilder, who's the governor's press secretary, said, not going to happen. Well, um, something else that's not going to happen is uh, Ruben Gallego being kicked <laughs> off the ballot because he happened to change his name to his, his mother's surname back in 2008. What was this all about with Mary Rose Wilcox? What, what so, was she doing? So Mary Rose Wilcox seized on this lawsuit that uh, her ally had filed against Ruben Gallego, claiming that he is using not his real surname. And the complaint said, well, because he used to be, or he is rather, uh, Ruben Marin Larena. I hope I got that one right. Um, and that is his real name, and we could not find any court document showing, showing that he has uh, changed his name. In fact, you know, the lawsuit, of course, is baseless. Uh, the fact of the matter is he has, Ruben has legally changed his name. Uh, there are court documents showing that he has legally changed his name. And, and more than that, there's a very, he offered a very compelling reason for changing his name. He said, look, my father, our father, abandoned us when we were young. We struggled. I wanted to honor my mom. So I changed my name to Gallego. But and it goes beyond that. Number one, there, you know, I love how Mary Rose's people are saying, well, it was the court clerk who misfiled something. You know, before you file a lawsuit, you might want to do your due diligence, number one. Number two is, let's even assume for argument's sake that he was, he's been in public office under a different name. He has run under this name. It's not like he's trying to hide his past by changing his name. And number three, where was the apology? Well, there was no apology. Yeah, that was one of the most shocking things about this whole thing. When they were pr proven to be completely false, wrong allegations, uh, baseless, really things that you, a, a good lawyer should have picked up on very quickly. Uh, the media knew about Ruben's uh, name change years ago. He's been very open about this. Anyone in real political <laughs> circles with him knows about this. Once all this came out, you know, six hours, 12 hours yeah. after they filed the lawsuit, uh, there was no apology, and more than that, they doubled down on it. They, they used his uh, middle name and then Gallego in the uh, press release about it. They said it was hidden from public view as if like he had hid it when it was a clerical and, and, error. And I love the fact that this from somebody who sometimes came to as Mary Rose Garrido Wilcox because she wants to use a name that somebody might remember. I mean, is come this, on, folks. Yeah, is, the, is, is this really the way we want to campaign? Is this a misstep that could really factor in this race? Oh, yeah, this blew up in her face uh, about as horribly as it could have. I mean, my favorite things to come out of this were uh, kind of references to 1070 or the birther movement. Uh, when is Ruben Gallego? going to have to show Mary Rose Wilcox his <laughs> long form birth certificate. Oh boy. All right. Uh, listen, we got about a minute and a half left here. We had a, a primary debate for Congressional District 1 here, the Republican oh, yes. primary debate. Uh, real quickly, impressions. My impression is I'm further conservative than you are. I'm further to the right. I mean, it was 24 minutes of absolutely, I am more conservative, I am more wacko, if you will, than the next person. And that shows exactly how it's happening. And the great part and I give credit to our host here, is he said to them finally, um, while you're doing this, you do know somebody has to survive this and run against a Democrat, and don't you think that'll affect you? Oh, no, no, this, this is gonna sell in November. And this was a, this was a change from uh, Speaker Tobin, who's kind of seen as the front runner in this race. This was a change in tactic for him. Previously, he's been running against Obama and uh, Ann Kirkpatrick. This time, he was really facing the people in the room, uh, the people who he's gotta beat in a primary just to get there, and going on the offensive against them, which was a, a very much a different strategy than we've seen from him. Maybe he's realizing he does have primary opponents. Yes, and he also had an interesting comment about the Tea Party, saying he doesn't, it wasn't as strong as it had been. We've gone to yeah. meetings, not as many people there. Next night, Next Eric night. Cantor takes the old uh, I know. swan dive. And you know, anybody who predicts the demise of the Tea Party is, is whistling in a graveyard, let me tell you. Okay, so impressions, did anyone come out uh, looking better or worse? Uh, well, I certainly think that Gary Keeney got some exposure because he was sort of the, the unknown in the race. Uh, obviously, from the perspective of, uh, of, of Tobin, 
you know, he came across a little bit petty. The you know the fact is, he said you know to one of his opponents, oh, "What else you got?" You know, the, the New Yorker came out. Yeah, he also said he didn't write his own Medicaid expansion plan. He said a lot of things during that debate. I, I, I think it uh, goes to Ann Kirkpatrick, or maybe, as you said, Gary Keeney, just for not repeating the 99% comment. Any problems with that? I'm still really deciding who is the most conservative. All right, well, we'll let you sit on that one for a while. Uh, Monday on Arizona Horizon, we'll discuss potential changes to Arizona's medical marijuana program, including the possible addition of PTSD as a qualifying condition. That's Monday evening, 5.30 and 10 right here on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.